Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Shart, you may present your closing. Thank you, Your Honor. Yeah, I didn't think Doug was going to go first either. Accusations are easy to make. Allegations are easy to wage. And this indictment has plenty of both. But here's the thing. There's a big difference between making allegations and proving them in court beyond a reasonable doubt to the citizens of Fulton County. It's a different matter entirely. The state has spent the past year with a hammer in their hand, banging on a square peg that they call evidence. Banging, banging, banging trying so hard to fit that square peg into the round hole that they call their narrative, their theory. Mm. And the reality is that square peg does not fit in that round hole. It never fit. The state hasn't proven their case, and they certainly haven't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. In this indictment, the state alleged, accused Shannon Stilwell in count one of violating the Georgia, uh, conspiring to violate the Georgia RICO Act. Hmm. He did not. They have not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm going to ask you to find Shannon Stilwell not guilty. In count two, the state alleged that Shannon Stilwell on January 10, 2015, shot and killed Donovan Thomas. He did not. The state hasn't proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm going to ask you to find Shannon Stilwell not guilty of count two. It counts 49 through 54. The state has alleged that Shannon Stillwell on March 14, 2022, shot and killed Shamel Drinks. He did not. The state has not proven their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'm going to ask you to find Shannon Stillwell not guilty. Good morning. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think I've made this abundantly clear over the past year. My name is Max Shard, and I represent Shannon Stillwell. But that's not the entire story. In fact, I have been joined by my co-counsel, Mr. David Botts, my wonderful legal assistant, Shaquille Kokomo, and it's been our honor to represent Mr. Shannon Stillwell throughout this process. And I'm excited for the opportunity to talk to all of you about the evidence that we have heard over this past year. But before we get started with that, I want to acknowledge you, the jurors. I want to acknowledge the immense time commitment that you have given this case. I want to acknowledge the sacrifice the sacrifice to your family, the sacrifice to your job, the sacrifice to your vacation plans. I want to acknowledge the patience that you have shown me and all the other attorneys. And I want to acknowledge the attention that you have shown this case. It's greatly appreciated. I acknowledge the fact that you have been paying close attention to this case. And for that reason, I'm going to try to avoid rehashing every piece of evidence. I'm going to try to be as direct and concise as possible mm -hmm. to avoid unnecessarily taking up too much more of your time. Mr. Kokomo, if you could put page three up. So, 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's just get into it, okay? Count one, as um, the state discussed in their opening, Mr. Stilwell is charged with conspiracy to violate the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act. And essentially they're saying he conspired to acquire, maintain directly or indirectly an interest in and control of United States currency and other personal property through a pattern of racketeering activity. And while associated with an enterprise, did unlawfully conspire to conduct and participate in directly and indirectly such enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. It's a lot of words, that's a mouthful. And we're going to get to talking about what that means, what it doesn't mean, how it applies to the evidence that's been presented in this case. But before we even get there, I want to talk to you about a big part of the state's case in count one, but also the other counts that they allege against my client. And that is the state's use of quote unquote expert witnesses. Uh -oh. specifically the gang investigators that uh -oh. they have called. Uh-oh. Uh, Mr. Kokomo, if you could put on page four. He about to get them. They've called, as, as you probably recall. Witnesses were trash. A gentleman named Beltnap, uh, investigator Underwood, uh, investigator Dennis, investigator Gaither, and investigator Viverito. Some of those people they've called multiple times in this case. And I want to talk to you about how to analyze their testimony and what your duties as jurors are uh, to consider how much weight to give the testimony of those witnesses, those quote unquote self proclaimed experts. <laughs> You'll be given this jury instruction. 13130 about expert witnesses, and I'm going to focus on the second paragraph. It says, you are not required to accept the testimony of any witnesses, expert or otherwise. Testimony of an expert, like that of all witnesses, is to be given only such weight and credit as you think it is properly entitled to receive. So, and Mr. Atkins talked about this in his opening a little bit. Expert witnesses are just like any other witness. And you're going to be instructed on how to evaluate the credibility of any witness. Not just lay witnesses, but experts as well. And there's some factors that the Honorable Court is going to give you to consider in evaluating the credibility and evaluating how much weight to give these witnesses. Some of the factors are their manner of testifying, how they come across at the stand, how they act, hmm. their means and opportunity of knowing facts for which they testify, their interest or lack of interest in the outcome of the case. Are they biased? And their personal credibility as you observe it. Those are all factors you can consider when evaluating Investigator Gaither, Investigator Dennis, Investigator Viverito. So let's talk about the testimony and what we observed from the stand from these experts. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the training. What did we learn about their training, all these experts? Well, we heard GGIA, Georgia Gang Investigators Association, we heard that a lot, about how there's 20 members. Remember, and we ask about what your training is, and they say, well, I go to the, the two-day seminar every, every year, GGIA, GGIA, there's 20 members, and then we learn who teaches at these seminars. Remember Detective Underwood? Remember Detective Underwood? And Detective Underwood was a nice lady, but she was sent up here on a fool's errand. They wanted her to testify about the intersection of gangs and music. And she clearly wasn't qualified. She knew almost nothing about music. Um, but she said, yeah, I'm qualified because I, I think I did a two hour block a couple years ago on that. Okay. What? I think Viverito taught that class. 
okay. So now Viverito is the teacher. So I asked her, I said, oh, very interesting, you took a two-hour class a couple years ago on this subject, and that makes you an expert, okay. Um, did you get, did you guys hear from any uh, experts in black history, black art, any literature professors, anyone that has studied hip-hop, anyone from the hip-hop community, anyone from the community at large, when you guys all meet, the 20 of you, to talk about gang stuff at this seminar? Nope. It was just Investigator Viverito. Okay, what about scholarly reports? Nope. Just in Investigator Viverito. The more we ask these witnesses, Come these on, man. experts, about what their training is, what their background is, what their basis for testifying as experts and telling us how to analyze things, <laughs> telling us what certain words mean, telling us what's gang-related or not, telling us what's relevant and what's not. It all stems from these meetings, this echo chamber that they have, where they have hear from no one else, no outside voices at all. Mm -hmm. And they all call each other experts. And they even created an association to look official. Talk about their manner of testimony, or testifying, excuse me. Think about Lieutenant Gaither when she was on the stand. Remember when I was, when I was allowed to ask questions? I tried to ask her some questions when they weren't vague. Um, did she really want to answer my questions? You know, you, you, you see on direct with the state, back and forth, it's like a tango. Yeah, it's like a script. And then I get up, where another defense attorney gets up to ask questions. Can't get a simple answer for anything. He's what right. What color is the sky? Oh, let me tell you about the FedEx video. <laughs> Just commentary, commentary, commentary. Same thing with Investigator Viverito. Just unnecessary commentary. Avoiding ans answering questions that I ask. Clearly, Investigator Dennis was doing the same thing. He's out of here. He was sent home. Consider the manner that they testify and how much weight and credibility they really have in this matter. Think about their interest and lack of interest in the case, also known as their bias. Mr. Uh, Kokomo, would you put up uh, Mr. Williams 70A for me? He's cooking them all at once. God dang. Take it easy on him, Max. Remember this? Remember Lieutenant Gaither getting up there? Oh yeah, I saw that. This was important. This was a symbol of a gang war. This is the gang war that was going on. This is YSL declaring war on Bird Gang, which is an offshoot of the IF Gang. Oh yeah, that's what it is. She told you that. As sure as can be, the expert that y'all are supposed to rely on. Well, what did my good friend, Attorney Brian Steele do? Brought in the album cover. Wait a second, you're saying that this is a hawk skull in a gang war? Um, isn't this an album cover of a collaboration between my client, Young Thug, this is attorney still talking, mm -hmm. Young Thug and Future? And isn't Future, isn't his label Free Bands? And isn't Future's Free Bands mascot an eagle? Isn't this album just cover just signifying the collaboration between the eagle and the snake? Doesn't that make more sense? After all, that's exactly what the album is. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Mr. Um, Kokomo, could you put up 471 VV? Well, not VV again. Remember this? This Coco that's not 471 BB. Come on, Mr. Kokomo. And actually, could you put up 471 VBA first? Okay, we saw that video. But first, actually, BB, BB.
Come on, Mr. Kokomo. Investigator Viverito brought this into evidence, said this was one of the social media posts that she pulled. Remember that? When she wrote no reports about pulling social we'll media, we have no idea what she looked at, what she didn't. She just determines what's relevant. Not, not us. Not you. You don't get to see that. She determines. Remember, this came into evidence. She said, of course, she didn't give us a date because she wrote no report, but she said she collected this shortly after the shooting of Chamel Drinks. I run with what you saying. I run with cold-blooded killers, blooded killers. And that's Quamarvius Nichols. That looks pretty bad. Looks bad. It's posted a day after this killing, and it's a post, and clearly that's what it says. No other explanation. And then what do we find out later? What do we find out later? Could you put on 471 VV? Can you play it, Mr. Kokomo? We find out that this was part of a post, a story that had a bunch of different posts about fear of roller coasters, about being sick, a whole, whole bunch of different things. And then we finally get to the part where it has the lyrics from uh, Young Boy Never Broke Again, right? Let's watch. We don't even see these lyrics. Why don't we see them on this post? Because they're on for a millisecond in the very beginning of the switch. And we hear about Instagram and how those aren't really words that Mr. Nichols would have typed. Those are words from a song that he picked. And sometimes you pick the lyrics, if you want, and sometimes Instagram picks them for you. Mm -hmm. But what else do we see from watching the entire post? Those weren't even the featured lyrics. The lyrics were being transitioned to the lyrics that either Instagram or Mr. Nichols fit, picked. But in a split millisecond, for whatever reason, these lyrics that Investigator Viverito so desperately wanted you guys to see, we're on the screen. And so what did Investigator Viverito do? She gets the post. She goes frame by frame until it gets to that exact point where it has what she feels looks like incriminating words by Mr. Nichols. Words that weren't even picked by him. And she freezes it and she screenshots it and then she puts it in front of you. Again, no report about what she did. She manipulated the evidence. Dang. And she's caught. But what does that tell you about her when we're talking about assessing credibility, your lack of interest in the case, your bias? Does she have an agenda when she does things like that? Of course she does. She's not a neutral witness. She might as well be sitting here. But I don't even think they would do that. Personal credibility as you observe it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kokomo, could you put that other exhibit that you put up, the affidavit? Well, dang. Headshots today, Max. Five thirty VV. This is the affidavit. Remember, we learned about affidavits, and Investigator Viverito was looking into the assassination attempts that she was uh, of of Mr. Rashawn Bennett in the jail, and she wanted to search Jeffrey Williams' home, right? And so she had to fill out an affidavit to give it to a judge to get permission to to convince the judge basically to mm -hmm. give her permission to search Jeffrey Williams' home for evidence. So what does she do? She finds a, a conversation, a text thread, where Mr. Williams says, YSL rule the world, kid, 24M on an N head. And she bolds it and makes it bigger 
and circles it for the judge to draw attention to that because, of course, she wants the judge to feel that Mr. Williams is just ordering hits on people. That's the implication. That's the message she's sending the judge. And here I am. I know about Jeffrey Williams 3 and Jeffrey Williams 4 that Mr. Steele brought in about the day before this this text thread about Lil Uzi Vert putting a $24 million diamond into his own forehead and Jeffrey Williams thinking that's funny and that, that conversation happening and this having nothing to do with ordering hits on anyone. And here I am, I say, oh, let me, let me confront Investigator Viverito with this. And what was my point, really? What, what, did we, what should have happened? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I misinterpreted that. You're right. And then I would have been Mr. Smart Lawyer and say, see, jurors, Investigator Viverito doesn't always know what she's talking about. She misinterpreted that one when she's telling you what my client means when he says things, what other people mean when they say things. Investigator Viverito doesn't know. She makes mistakes. That's what I thought was going to happen. But what happened? Something far darker. Investigator Viverito sat in that chair and said, she doubled down. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know what? Even knowing what I know now about 24M on an end's head, even knowing what I know now, I would still put it in that affidavit. That's all I needed to hear. That's what she said. Yeah, I would mislead a judge. Yeah, I would lie in an affidavit. Yeah, I would cheat because I'm that invested in this case. I'm that invested with taking these guys down. I'm that invested. And if she's that invested in that, and the rest of these gang investors, investigators are that invested, consider their credibility. Take what they say with a huge grain of salt. You don't have to believe what they say. You can disregard everything they say. The law allows you to do that. Dang. When they say, oh, this is a hybrid gang, and they can't even explain what that means or why it's classified as a hybrid gang and it's just something that they come up with at their little private meetings every year at these two-day seminars where they don't get input from anyone else. You don't have to buy that. It's not a hybrid gang. Yo, Max, come on, man. All right. Come on, Max. Go Let's start man. talking about count one. Uh, Ms. Kokomo, if you could put page 14 up for me. And I did not envy Mr. Atkins because this is very complicated to even discuss. Um, but essentially, the way I'm going to try to break this down is that the state needs to prove all elements of this case and all elements of this charge beyond a reasonable doubt, each and every element. Each and I'm and going to focus on one. two different aspects as relates to the case against Shannon Still, this RICO case, count one. The knowing will and willfully conspired with one or more others to participate in the enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. So that's the first thing we're going to focus on, whether it's been proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Shannon Stillwell knowingly and willfully conspired to participate in the enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity, knowingly and willfully. Not he was just there, not he just hangs around, knowingly and willfully conspired. And then the second part that we're going to focus on uh, a little bit later is uh, number six and seven, that someone committed in, or that the state has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that someone committed an overt act to further the criminal objective of this conspiracy. Improve that. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when we're talking about the question about whether Mr. Stilwell knowingly and willfully conspired to basically take part in racketeering activity, a pattern of racketeering activity. 
I think we have to look at this whole case in context. I think we have to consider the origin story of what everyone's calling YSL, whatever you want to call it. The state seems to suggest that a bunch of people all came together to commit crimes. Just a big conspiracy, we're all going to come together and we're going to be a racketeering organization. That's not the case. Now, let me be clear. Of course, crimes were committed. Crimes were committed by people with YSL tattoos on their face. Crimes were committed by people with, that use YSL emojis on social media. Crimes, I'm sure, were committed by people that use the word slap. But that's not the issue here. The issue is whether Shannon Stilwell knowingly and willfully conspired to be part of this RICO organization. Alleged RICO organization. Let's, We've let's heard be clear. from different young men, and, and we're, again, we heard from them in the year 2024, talking about things that happened in 2012, 2013. So please keep in mind when you see a 28 year old testifying in 2024. We're talking about maybe a 16-year-old back in 2012. And we've heard testimony from people from Cleveland Avenue. We heard from Walter Murphy. We heard from Trontavia Stevens. We heard testimony from people from Capitol Homes. We heard from Quindarius Zachary. We heard from Antonio Sledge. We know that my client, Mr. Stilwell, is from Thomasville. We know that he was raised by his grandmother. His mother was never part of his life due to her drug addiction. We know about these communities, about poverty, about the lack of education. I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush. This does not apply to everyone in these communities. But as a whole, we know the struggles that these communities have had. Lack of education, underemployment, drug addiction, kids looking for food, sharing clothes with peers, Mm -hmm. hopelessness, a sad, tacit acceptance that it's either rap, prison, or death. That's the reality where a lot of these kids at the time were living. And the state, throughout their presentation of this case, has played several videos of people, of young people in parking lots, at parks. Some of them might have a gun, using foul language. Someone might be smoking marijuana. Some might be saying slap. A lot of times people are, and it's kind of sad to watch, a lot of people talking about all the stuff they got, when we all know they really don't have anything. About all the cars they own, remember that one gentleman? Oh yeah, I got my, oh I'm getting my daughter this, I'm getting my son that car. You know, cat. We saw those videos and I'm watching all these videos and I'm wondering, you know, what's the point? What, why is the state playing this? Just to show like bad kids or who they feel are bad kids? Just to show who they feel are future criminals? Like what's the point of these videos that are really sad to watch? And then they played this video and it's marked 54W, and I'm going to ask Mr. Kokomo to pull it up, but not play it yet. And it's a video where you see a group of people hanging out in the park, in a parking lot in the park, and you see Jeffrey Williams. Shannon Stilwell's not in this video. And you see Jeffrey Williams leaning on a car. And you see his emaciated body. You see his teeth that are rotten. And he's wearing pants that are clearly too short, too small, clearly mm -hmm. been handed down, traded. They didn't come out of Fitz Plaza. You see him wearing a Alabama Letterman jacket. And I'm not talking about like the cool Letterman jacket that you might get at Mitchell and Ness. That's where you get 
like high price sporting goods, throwback stuff. Where? Not cool like that. I've never even heard of that. Like one that was probably made in the 80s. The letterman is, the sleeves are all nasty. And the thing comes down to like his navy. And people are picking at him. Not, not in a harmful way, but picking at him. Picking at his clothes. Go ahead, Mr. Kokomo. What happens there? I think about when I was young. If I had to struggle, if I had to wear clothes that I was embarrassed about, if I was embarrassed about anything, I would hide, I would run. I would stay inside. I'd be ashamed. I might lash out at people picking at me. But what happens there? Jeffrey Williams takes those clothes, those tattered clothes, those old clothes, those ill-fitting clothes, and he twists it. He turns it around. Now, these aren't rags. This ain't nothing to be ashamed of. You can take it down. This is white boy swag. This is swag. Think about that for a second. What that means, and I'm not suggesting Shannon Stillwell saw that video, but that mindset. I'm not ashamed where I came from. In fact, I'm going to turn it into a positive. Mm. I'm going to turn it into a sense of pride. And lo and behold, what happens? Everyone starts wearing the skinny jeans. Now think about if you're Walter Murphy. Think about if you're Trontavious Stevens in that Cleveland Avenue neighborhood. You're struggling, you're dealing with the same things that Jeffrey Williams is. And you're ashamed and you don't feel good about yourself. But then all of a sudden you see someone with confidence. Someone that's not ashamed. And all of a sudden, you know what else? They can rap. And people are starting to pay attention. And the shows start being booked. And one second it's in, at, around the corner. Next second it's up the street. And then all of a sudden it's downtown Atlanta. Think about the pride. If you have nothing and you see someone that you know making it. Mm -hmm. And making it on his terms with that level of confidence. Now think about if you're Shannon Stillwell, <clears throat> raised by your grandmother, facing many of the same issues that Jeffrey's talking about, that he's rapping about, that all these young men in Cleveland Avenue are facing, many of the same challenges. And then you also want to be a rapper. And all of a sudden, this person that you can identify with, this person that has the confidence you wish you had, mm -hmm. this person that's taking everything negative and turning it into a positive. And then he raps too. And it's all blowing up in your backyard. And you want to be a musician. And you want to go into the studio. And you want studio time. And you know Jeffrey Williams and his friends have studio time. Because now they have backing. Mm -hmm. And studio time ain't cheap. And you want connections. And you know he has connections. And you know those connections have paid off. B Slime. We know he's been on songs with B Slime. Vito, a songwriter for 300 Entertainment. Dolly, Rooney Lee, a signed artist. Shannon's been on songs with him. If you're Shannon Stillwell, isn't that exactly where you'd want to be? Isn't that exactly who you'd want to associate with? Not to conspire 
to violate any RICO laws. You want to be there because he's doing what you want to do and you are identifying with him. Mm -hmm. What have we learned about this quote unquote gang that they're saying exists? You know, Detective Beltnap, the first time he testified, talked about gangs and talked about red and blue don't mix. They have a solid hierarchy and structure, strict rules, yep. chain of command. You're beaten in. You can't get out. If you try to get out, you're beaten out. If you're false flagging, if you're claiming to be what part of the gang and you're not, severe say. repercussions occur. Well, what do we know about YSL? This group of young men, many of whom are musicians, many of whom have known Jeffrey Williams since they were little, who are thrilled for his success, who are living through him. Well, there's no initiation, mm -hmm. no dues, no money sharing at all, no rules or organizational structure, no hierarchy, no rules about false flagging. Anyone can do it. Everyone does do it. People all over the world wiping their nose. It's not false flagging because it's not a gang. At when all. LeBron James does it, he's not false flagging because there's no gang. He's showing he identifies with the movement. He, he identifies with the confidence that Jeffrey Williams shows. He identifies with turning negative into positive. There's no gender rules in YSL. And there's no exclusions. You a square? You're in. Sure. Whatever you want. You're a blood? Yeah, you can hang out. You're a crip? Yeah, you can hang out. You're not affiliated at all? Yeah, you can hang out. You an athlete? Sure, you can hang out. You a musician? Yeah, you can hang out. You a nerd? Yeah, you can hang out. No one sent anyone away because it's not a game. It's not exclusive. The only people that say this is a gang are those people that all talk to each other at GGIA, <laughs> at the Georgia Gang Investigators Association, that don't want to hear from anyone else and just want to have their conclusions. Those people are also very biased in this yeah, case. It's true. So, has the state proven that Shannon Stillwell knowingly and willfully conspired to participate in an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity? Well, Mr. Atkins no. says, well, he killed Donovan Thomas, so that's proof right there. Well, that's pretty circular logic. He didn't kill Donovan Thomas. Well, he killed Shamal Drinks, that's proof right there. No, he didn't kill Shamal Drinks. What have they proven Shannon Stillwell has done? to say that he knowingly and willfully conspired to do anything other than to be around Jeffrey Williams and try to make music and further his rap career and be around people that he identified with. Okay. He's been in social media pictures with many of the people that he hangs out with. Okay. Uh, he uses the word slat. Uses a Green snake emoji, okay, a lot of people do that. He posted, uh, he spends time in a recording studio with other people that know Jeffrey Williams. Yeah, of course he does. He makes rap videos and posts them online. Yep. Are his friends in the videos? Yep. He uses hand signs such as wiping his nose. Yeah. Post video. The state played one video in their closing about Shannon Stillwell calling out game. Look at the bottom of that video. What's it say? Baller alert. Shannon wants to be a rapper. It's picked up on baller alert. It's aggregated throughout the internet. This is not coming off of Shannon's 
Instagram feed. This is national. Think about how many eyes are seeing that. Someone that no one knows calling out, trying to pick a fight with a well-known rapper. The game. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what any music person, not necessarily a lawyer, I wouldn't tell Shannon to do that, but it's exactly what any music person would tell Shannon, who's trying to make it in the rap game, they would tell him to do exactly that. Get noticed. That doesn't mean he's knowingly and willfully conspiring to be part of any RICO organization. It's true. Mr. Kokomo, will you please put up page 13? This photo was put in by Attorney Steele. Uh oh, not Braun. Who's going to tell LeBron that he's acting like a RICO conspirator? <laughs> Who's going to tell LeBron Come on, that Max. he's now a hybrid gang member? Mm hmm. In fact, we just heard that the state said about wiping the nose meant, according to the gang experts. I Who's going to tell LeBron that he's like ordering a hit? in the middle of NBA warm-ups. Yes. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no. Is what the gang investigators say, should we really take it? Hook, line, and sinker? I suggest we should not. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to move on to the state's attempt to prove the commission of an overact in furtherance of a criminal objective. And mind you, they have to prove all of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's not like I have to show everyone did not happen. Uh, these elements all have to be proven by the state. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a reminder, this isn't just about people committing crime because I'm just gonna sit here and tell you there's no doubt that people that are in social media posts that are in evidence in this case. There's no doubt that people with YSL tattoos, there's no doubt that people that say slat have committed crimes. No one's disputing that. Isolated crimes by indivi an individual or a group of individuals that have nothing to do with any alleged conspiracy are, cannot be over acts. It's not just crimes that, or other acts that are alleged against people associated with YSL. The acts must further the criminal objectives of the alleged conspiracy. So what do they focus on? They focus on, first of all, oddly, artistic expression. Jeffrey's lyrics. Like, like we're just going to pretend there's not a thing called rap music, we're, we're going to pretend there's not a thing called artistic license, we're going to pretend there's not a thing called YSL, the record label. Mm -hmm. And when Jeffrey says slat in his song or slime in his song, which is recognized worldwide and is popular and sells albums, we're going to pretend that there's no context to this and we're just going to pretend that all these lyrics are somehow designed to further a RICO organization. That's absurd. We're going to pretend Shannon Stilwell's statements about uh, bragging, about beating a murder rap, which is good for his music career, is somehow furthering some criminal objectives of some conspiracy. That's absurd. They list in their list of overt acts a bunch of social media posts. Social media posts of people with tattoos on their face. Nothing else. Just, oh, he took a picture with a tattoo on his face or wearing slime clothing or Make America Slime Again clothing. Clothing created, mind you, by Miles Farley, a person who was able to, again, turn negative into positive and turn that movement that was going in on in Cleveland Avenue in a way for him to make money through selling clothing, for him to provide to his family. 
Turns out Miles Farley didn't subscribe to, oh, your options are athlete, entertainer, dead, or jail. He decided to design clothes. Mm -hmm. And what's his reward? You're part of a conspiracy. What does this state say were these overt acts? Well, they list a lot of petty drug selling. We heard from Trontavia Stevens, I don't know if you remember, but it was, it was a long time ago, I know. But he talked about being pulled over. And I made sure to ask him. And he wasn't denying that he had a bag of weed on him. I said, hey man, who went in on, who went in on you with you on that bag of weed? I, I bought it. Okay, yeah, but when you sold it and made a profit, who are you going to share the money with? You look at me like I was crazy. Man, this is a $100 bag of weed. I ain't sharing money with anyone. I'm a drug dealer. I buy drugs and I sell drugs and I make a profit and I keep the profit. What evidence have we seen at all that any of this petty drug dealing had anything to do with furthering some criminal enterprise? It's isolated acts. Right, and so what we have ultimately... They list gun possession. 2019, they say... Shannon Stilwell is possession of a gun in furtherance of the criminal objectives of the conspiracy. Man. <laughs> he said, man. We have heard since ever since Shannon Stilwell was falsely accused of killing Donovan Thomas in 2015 about people shooting at his head, people shooting at the car he's in. People are trying to kill him. And you think he's possessing a gun as some furtherance of some conspiracy? Does that make any sense? He's trying to survive. The murder of Jamari Holmes. Tragic event. Horrible. Complete waste of three lives. Jamari Holmes, Rodelius Ryan, and Mr. Blaylock. Three teenagers. Senselessly. All lose their lives to varying degrees. Jamari Holmes, obviously loses his life in the, in the most real sense. Absolute tragedy. No one's going to say otherwise. This list is an overact in furtherance of, why, of, of furtherance of the criminal objectives of the alleged conspiracy. It was like a 15-year-old doing something incredibly stupid. What objectives was that furthering? It wasn't. It's an isolated act by committed by someone who screams out YSL and screams out SLAT. But that doesn't mean it's furthering any conspiracy. We hear about Jaden Myrick. First of all, who the heck is Jaden Myrick? I know they put him on this indictment like yeah, to try to go. say, oh yeah, he's a co-conspirator in this too. But they're the ones that put his name on this indictment. What have we heard about Jaden Myrick? We ever hear about Jaden Myrick ever meeting Shannon Stillwell? Do we have any indication that Jaden Myrick knows Shannon Stillwell? Nope. What about Jeffrey Williams? Any indication that Jaden Myrick knows Jeffrey Williams? Who the heck's Jaden Myrick? But some dope at the, in the jail that's looking to make money by doing something incredibly stupid and attacking Rashawn Bennett. So he calls another dope and they, they come up with their own little, patch their own little plan, but it has nothing to do with some broad conspiracy that Shannon Stilwell willfully and knowingly joined. Mm -hmm. We heard about jail calls. They're all listed as over acts. Cordarius Dorsey calling Antonio Sumlin. Hey, I want you to attack some guy named, what, Victor Meadows. I think his name was. I can't even remember the guy's name. <laughs> Had nothing to do with this case. And, 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 uh, and Antonio Sumlin's like, what? And he's like, okay, man. And he hangs up the phone and doesn't do anything about it ever again. Is that furthering a conspiracy? And this was nope. the coup de grace. Christian Eppinger has an armed robbery arrest warrant out for it. And the police jump out on him, unmarked police, and say, get out, boy! And he has a gun. 
and he gets into it, the officer and shoots and runs. And then another officer shoots at him and he shoots back and he continues to run. Somehow the state is alleging that Christian Eppinger, no one else is there. No one's saying, hey, Christian Eppinger, do this for YSL. Mm -hmm. Christian Eppinger trying to avoid arrest, trying to stay free, <laughs> completely isolated from anything else going on in this case. Somehow Christopher, Christian Eppinger doing that idiotic, making that idiotic decision to shoot an officer to avoid being arrested, somehow that is in furtherance of some conspiracy that Shannon Stillwell knowingly and willfully joined? No. Nope. Nah. Doesn't make any sense. Miss Love shaking her head too. Like, yeah, that's dumb. I don't know why we put that in here. In review of count one, ladies and gentlemen, YSL is many things. It's not a gang, full-fledged or hybrid, and it's certainly not a RICO enterprise. Shannon Stillwell and associating himself with Jeffrey Williams and Trontavia Stevens and Quimarvius Nichols, his good friend, and Miles Farley, and others, and Wooney Lee, he wasn't knowingly and willfully conspiring with anyone to participate in any enterprise aimed at ra a pattern of racketeering activity. He was in the mix. He was trying to make music. He was also, coincidentally, if we're being honest, he was selling drugs. He wasn't sharing them with anyone. He wasn't sharing the profits. He was selling drugs and trying to make music. And he was around the right people to be trying to do that with. Because those connections were going to, in his mind, further his music career, which is what he wanted. Right. And no overt acts were ever committed in furtherance of any conspiracy that Shannon Stillwell knowingly and willfully joined. The state has to prove every element of that charge beyond a reasonable doubt. They have failed. There is reasonable doubt. It's not true. And your verdict on count one must be not guilty.